Let me invite you to turn to Titus chapter 2 this evening. Um, I've, been sing- I've been thinking about grace. You know, as we've been going through uh, Thessalonians, Paul sprinkles the word here and there, grace and peace be unto you, grace always being first. Um, or this morning's text, we have everlasting consolation and comfort through grace. And I wanted to look at what grace is, what it means. And so God's grace toward us. You know, this morning there was a, there was a, a mishap, and that was my fault. Bryce got up here to, to, to sing a wonderful grace of Jesus uh, there, just at the end of the service. Um, I, I, I was supposed to take that out and put it in the evening service. So it, somehow it got into the p.m. or a.m. order of service. So that's my fault. That's not Bryce's fault. But uh, hey, grace covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> so um, anyway, I've been thinking about grace. And uh, we have emphasized prayer on the Sunday evenings this year, beginning in January, if you remember. We went through the video course about prayer, uh, going on prayer walks, praying and God's blessings. Uh, remember, I, I'll, still praying that we reach somebody within uh, a mile of here. Okay, We had some come during the um, uh, VBS week. God's been answering prayer. But uh, I wanted to emphasize something that goes into confidence in having prayer answered. James 5.16 said it in this way, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So prayer answers to prayer and righteousness. A righteous person can have confidence that his prayer will avail much. The word avail means to be forceful, to be energized, to do work, to get to be efficacious, to be effective. And so I wanted to talk about grace that makes us holy. We sung about the holiness of God, holy, holy, holy. We sung about just now what grace does. It cleanses within. It it is marvelous. It pardons our sin. But what does grace do according to Titus? Grace makes you holy. It makes you righteous. And that holiness, in turn, gives us confidence in in a prayer life that avails that works, that is effective. We'll see what grace brings according to two, chapter 2 of Titus, and we'll read verses 1 to 15. We'll concentrate on the last four or five verses. So uh, let me just give you the context before we start reading. Titus, young pastor, um, a Gentile, he was feeling the pressure, the effects of the older people in the congregation looking down on him. He was feeling uh, the pressure of being a young pastor, and he wanted out, essentially. He wanted another assignment. You know, when things are uncomfortable, when things are difficult, we want out. We want to run instead of staying and having character developed. And so Paul writes him this letter because he's having a hard time in ministering in in this place called Crete. And uh, Paul gives him a letter. So when you feel like quitting... Whatever position, whatever place that you're at right now, if you feel like quitting, read some of what Paul says to Titus. And in short, Paul tells Titus, listen, teach the truth, obey the truth, fight the good fight, even your personal personality shortcomings. He was timid, um, self-conscious about his age perhaps, but Paul writes to him, look, Teach, obey, live the truth out, face your enemies, don't run. Don't be afraid of confrontation. And so in chapter 2, Paul is urging the whole congregation to be consistent in their Christian behavior. So let's go ahead and read chapter 2 of Titus, beginning in verse 1, and we'll stop at verse 10. Just to get the context again. Uh, Paul speaking to Titus, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at the home, good, obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. 
Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining or stealing, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So here, whether you're young or old, whether you're married or single, whether you're a, a, a boss or an employee, a servant or a master, those are all needed in the church, and those are all jobs that need to be done in the church. A test of the spiritual fellowship of the church is its ability to accept people of different positions and stations, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're rich or poor, whether you are um, you know, free or a slave. So how we live can be verse 5. It could either blaspheme God's word, your Christian walk, or Verse 10, it could beautify the Bible by the way you behave. You adorn the doctrine of God. So how you live is seen. And as he's talking to Titus, this young pastor, he says, you, according to verses 7 and 8, you set the example. And then we get to verses 11 to 15, which we'll, which we'll concentrate on this evening. Let's read it. For the grace of God, that's the focus tonight. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So after he talks about the expected mode of behavior for all ages in the church, he tells, he tells Titus, this is what grace does. Okay, you've received it, and this is how grace works in the life of believers. One of the great purposes of grace is our salvation. And one of the great purposes of salvation is to produce a life of holiness, holy living. So Paul gives instructions on how people should live in the church in light of God's grace. We see what grace brings according to verse 11, right? Grace, as it says there in verse 11, for the grace of God bringeth salvation. What has God's grace done? What has God done for them in bringing them grace? Grace, he says, saves them and redeems them. According to verse 11, it brings salvation. And verse 14, it brings redemption or redeems us. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I think that phrase means that uh, the gospel of the grace of God has appeared to all different types of people. The gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ has appeared and has been preached to all kinds of people. And Paul affirms that, look, there, there is a, a universal problem, sin. But the universal remedy has been preached through the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So the gospel of grace brings salvation and redeems us. That phrase, bringeth salvation. If you can think about it in this way, grace brings us salvation. Just think about the character of God. God is omniscient. He sees everything that you do. He sees everything that you think or desire. He's omniscient. And that grace is effective in his knowing you and your sinfulness. Think about God's omnipotence. He's all-powerful, and he can overwhelm even the mightiest of men. There is nothing that men can do when they are overwhelmed by the power of God. Remember, the earth is, or the heaven is his throne, the earth is his footstool. God's grace has to come in part into our salvation because we cannot save ourselves. God brings salvation. It didn't go looking for us. I mean, we didn't go looking for it. Salvation came through God's grace. God in his grace sent his son to redeem us. So it says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared. Okay, it, the sense is this. It, 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 the sense is, look, 
Jesus Christ came on the earth. Okay? And uh, he has appeared. He's visited our planet, and he has given himself for our sins. And that grace has appeared to all men. And this is for the salvation of all men. His substitutionary work is for all, but is only effective for those who would believe. So, there is an invitation to every tongue, nation, class, group. There is a universal invitation. And uh, the letter to Timothy that Paul writes says a similar thing. Listen to 1 Timothy 2. This is speaking about God who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. So the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, what else does grace do? Not only does it bring salvation, if you look at verse 12 there, let me reread verse 12. The grace of God has, has come, and then it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That word for teaching is the word for child training, paideo, the, um, it's the word for training up a child in the way he should go. It is the idea of discipline by punishment, chastening, instruction, rebuke, as well as uh, just plain instruction and teaching, child training. Um, we know that this verse is teaching us that we are disciplined. We are trained by God's grace. God's grace trains us to be holy that we might glorify him. Every parent knows the process of child training involves positive and negative, right? There, there's the reward and positive instruction, and there's negative, there, there's rebuke, there's punishment. Um, one Greek scholar, D. Edmund Hebert, wrote, <laughs> tried to define paideo, uh, not paideo here, um, yeah, paideo, this child training. This is what grace does. It trains it's us. And this is how he described this word child training. I find it humorous. He, he says, uh, quote, Notwithstanding the assertions of some learned modern psychologists, the timely use of some physical persuasion on the posterior end is truly beneficial for the development of the child. Um, layman's terms, spankings are good. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, you apply the, the, the Board of Education on the seed of knowledge, that's this child training. Grace trains us to be holy. That's the message of God's grace. And so if we read into verses 1 to 10, how he was talking to all age groups in the church, the, the aged men, the aged women, the, uh, the young women, the young men, sober, all those things, that's what grace does. They're supposed to, to help them to be godly. They're supposed to help them to be self-disciplined. And so Again, negatively, grace tells us to say no to anything that is unlike God. Positively, grace tells us or teaches us to live a self-controlled and an upright and a godly life. Let's look at uh, that second part of verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. So we can say no to whatever is unlike God. That's what grace does. Grace saves us and trains us then in the school of holiness. Grace also denies, teaches us to deny worldly lusts. What does that mean? Grace teaches us to say no to sexual sins. It teaches us to say no to lust, wealth, sinful pleasure, fame, or anything else that is worldly. Listen to 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So grace teaches us to say no to those things which the world values. Pride, lust, and other worldly matters. What does great, you know, that's the negative side. That's the thou shall not, Right? Now look at the positive side of what grace does when it enters into a, the life of a believer. Grace teaches us that we should live soberly. The first positive thing, live soberly. That means that we are to live a self-controlled life, a life of restraint. This is in regards to the believer and his relationship to himself. Okay, here's a man 
that was once undisciplined in all things, but now grace has entered in, and now he can live a disciplined life, a sober, a serious, self-controlled life of prudence and restraint. That's his relationship to himself. He's been changed by grace. Grace also, the second positive trait of grace is that it teaches us to live righteously. And basically, righteous living is basically right living with people, right? If sober living is with myself, righteous living is how I relate with others. In my business dealings, in my word, I, I meet my obligations, I pay my bills, I do what's righteous in terms with people. Grace teaches me to do that. And then in the end, it says grace teaches us to live godly in this present world. Godly is your relationship with God. My duties that, are, that I'm responsible to God for, I'm faithful. I serve, I worship, I'm faithful in my stewardship of my time, my talent, and my treasure. So grace helps me with every aspect of relationships in life, with God and with men. And then he goes, uh, he, 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 he ends that positive three, positive, uh, the three positive instructions with in this present world. Okay, I think he's trying to get you to think of, look, in this present world, there's another spirit. There's a spirit of this age which denies that there's a God. There's a spirit of this age which denies that there's standards, that there's holiness. So grace teaches me that there is a standard of holiness. Grace teaches me that there is a God who is holy and that I'm to be holy like him. So grace then, as we summarize just that verse, is that grace changes us. It reforms us. It changes us from the inside out. It not only gives us a new position or standing. Okay, we're no longer in the slave market of sin, but we've been bought back, redeemed. We, a, a, a price has been paid, and now I'm free. And now that I'm free, I'm self-controlled. I'm righteous, and I'm godly, and I'm, I keep on growing in those areas. Now look at verse 13. After he says, look, grace will reform you, changes you. In verse 13, grace also helps you to look ahead and not get caught in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking for that blessed hope. Even though we live in this present age, we do not live like this present age. Okay, God has done something in us that we are different. And he'll go on to talk about the difference that it makes, what grace does in people. So we're looking for this blessed hope. We are pilgrims. We're kind of resident aliens. This world is not our home. And so we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious of appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, is this referring to the rapture or is this referring to the second coming? I believe it's referring to the rapture when, when the bridegroom comes and takes his bride for a seven-year wedding feast in heaven while the world has a seven-year tribulation, destruction. It could mean this is the, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior when he returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. It could mean that, but I think it, it, mean, it speaks of the rapture here. So we're looking for this bridegroom who's going to come for his church while in the meantime living in this age soberly, righteously, and godly. And um, this phrase at the end, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, is that talking about the two people of the Godhead or one? Two people of the, the, the Trinity or one? I think in the Greek language here, I know in the Greek language in the construction that it's speaking of Jesus himself. He is the great God and Savior. It's speaking of the one member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. We're looking for him to return, expecting his return. One day we'll see him face to face, but in the meantime, we're anticipating and living righteously. Now look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So God has brought us grace. What has Christ done? Christ has, as it says there, who gave. Christ gave himself for us. This, this is what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. As we await the return of Christ, his purpose is that we live a life that is well-pleasing to him. 
He gave himself for us. He became our substitute. Peter would say it in this way. He, he who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree. That's the idea of substitution. That's the idea of redemption. That's the second part of verse 14, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Key word is all, okay? Jesus could have just only done this. He could have just paid the price, paid the penalty. But he did more than pay the penalty of our sin. He redeemed us from all iniquity. He not only paid the penalty for our sin, but he has also given us the power to overcome the rule of sin in our lives. That's the great grace that is in Jesus Christ. It wasn't a halfway salvation. It is full. The salvation of the penalty from sin and salvation from the power of sin. We have, as we sung last week in the men's octet or whatever five people are, we've been changed. We have been changed. That's what grace does. He end, end up He's redeemed us from all iniquity. He set us free by paying a price. We were in the slave market of sin, and that price was his blood that set us free. And then it says, from all iniquity, that we should no longer have, that we are no longer under the dominion or the rule or the power of sin. Why else did he do this? Look at the end of verse 14, to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We spoke on this process of purification this morning, and that's the word sanctification. The Holy Spirit has set us apart unto salvation. And then, that's not it. That's not all. It's also purifying or sanctifying us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Um, This phrase here at the end of verse, uh, verse 14 where he says uh, he has uh, purified unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. When I was a, a young Christian, I was wondering what all that meant. What does it mean, a peculiar people? Does that mean odd, right? Does that mean um, just weird? That's not what purify himself a peculiar people means. The word peculiar does not mean odd or strange. It means he... He has purified a, he has made a peculiar people. He has made a special people for himself. He has, he has made himself a people that are not strange, but a people who belong to him in a special way. A people who don't belong to this world, but were created for another, heaven. That's what it means by a peculiar people. And then zealous of good works means we should have enthusiasm about doing righteous deeds. We should have enthusiasm about performing acts of kindness. As he said in Matthew 5, let, you know, let your light so shine before men that men might see your good works and then glorify your Father which is in heaven. So that's the reason he has set us apart as a special people to glorify himself that men might see and that he might receive the glory. God is not trying to reform this world, even though men might try. What God is doing is He's redeeming a people for Himself. I used to work in the people professions. I was a social worker. I remember we had to read certain books. I remember one book was called The New People Making. In other words, how do you make new people from broken people? God here is not trying to make reform people. He's redeeming people. He has given himself, Jesus Christ, as a ransom for our sins. You know, the world, secular counseling, social work, which I, was being tra- I had been trained in, they were training that you can become good and righteous on your own. Just do these things, one, two, three. And uh, Chuck Missler said this in regards to the world trying to reform or change themselves. Here's their phrases. I'm as good as the next person. Strike one. I'm doing the best that I can. Strike two. I'm trying to do better. Strike three. And you're out because that's not how you're remade. 
You must be born again. Self-effort can't do it. You must be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So let me finish here. Verse 15. After he's, he talks to Titus to tell him to do all these things and to teach about these things, he says in verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise thee. So Titus, this is what you have to say. These are the things that you need to teach and declare with all authority. So say it, speak it, declare it, and then exhort it. Encourage people to live practical lives of holiness. And then he goes, rebuke with all authority. Anybody who contradicted the apostolic teaching, anybody who would resist his, his authority or leadership in the church as he taught the Word of God, he is to rebuke them. Okay? It's not easy to be in ministry where you have to tell people you're doing wrong. You must stop. But this is what he says that Titus has to do. You don't have to be apologetic about it, Titus. This is what you say. This is what you do. And if they're contradictory, you are to carry on a forceful ministry. No matter how strong the personality is, no matter how influential the person is in the church, whether they have money, whether they have influence, or they're strong in leadership, if they're doing wrong, you rebuke them with all authority. And he goes on to say at the end, let no man despise you. Titus, you don't have to have any qualms about your, your Gentile background. You don't have to worry about your youth or your young age versus those who might be older than you and rebuking you. You speak the Word of God, and that makes all the difference. You can speak it to the very highest person in the land because it's God's Word, higher than all men. So he said the same thing to Timothy. Let no man despise thy youth. But he says to Timothy, be an example. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So Titus, grace changes people. Have confidence as you minister in a church that you want to get out of. He was told to step out aggressively, encourage those who were doing well, rebuke those who needed to be corrected, and don't be intimidated by anyone. So here, if you're ever feeling that you want to run, if you're ever feeling that you want to get out of a situation, a job or a circumstance, pray about it, think it through, get God's word on the matter. If you need to make a confrontation, get get God's word on the matter. Don't run from the problem because it is the problem that God put in your life to make you, to carry you. So Paul told Titus, look, teach the Scriptures. Live the Scriptures. Encourage. Correct. Don't be afraid of those who are older and, and, and uh, wealthier or have a higher position in the world than you do. Don't feel threatened. Speak the truth with all authority and don't let anybody despise you. Now, what, how do we apply this to our own lives here? You know that uh, what, what Paul told Titus to do, we are to do. Right, Everything that Paul said to Titus, look, teach the Word. We're to teach the Word. Encourage people. We're all to encourage people. Correct people when necessary. Okay, there's a lot that can be said to that. Okay, there's a right way and a wrong way to correct people. But everything he said to Titus, we are to do individually. And how can we apply this to our lives? We need to teach, we need to encourage, and we need to, to approach people if they're contradicting Scripture in the right manner, of course. So let us, as we think about how we can apply grace and holiness in our life. You know, school is starting up, and this is partly why I'm thinking about this too. You know, in the summertime, you get a little slack, you get a little soft, you get a little lazy, you get, you get up later in the morning, um, you, you, you slack on devotions, you slack on Bible reading, you slack on your witness, 
And so, um, you know, I'm preaching this to myself. What does grace do? Grace helps me to live a disciplined life. Is there a discipline in your life that you need to strengthen? Look, at God, look up God's Word about that discipline, and He will help you to strengthen that area of discipline in your life. Grace helps you to live righteously. Is there relationships where you aren't righteous or that you feel you're being mistreated? Okay, if you can let it go, let it go. But if it's irking you, you need to make it right with men. Grace teaches me to live holy, righteously, denying ungodliness and unholiness. And it helps me to live that I might glorify God. And in the meantime, as I'm living a grace-empowered life, I look up because Christ is coming. And I look for that blessed hope and that glory assurance of, of the return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope you are too. Let me encourage you. Listen, whatever it is, grace is the answer. And that's found in His Word. Find what God's Word says about the issue in your life that you might live a righteous, godly, and a disciplined life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you, Lord, for grace which changes us, redeems us, regenerates us from the inside out that we might live lives that are holy, that are righteous, that are not according to the spirit of this age. Because we are people, a special people, a peculiar people, pilgrims. This world, not our home. Heaven is our home. Help us, Lord, to live a life that is holy, that is becoming of children of God. Help us to live lives worthy of children of God. Thank you for the grace that you rain down upon us day after day and night after night. Let us lay hold of the grace that we have in the Word of God, the Spirit of God. Thank you for the grace that you've instilled in all of us through the person of Jesus Christ. Help us to live for Him by His Spirit's power with the Spirit's word. We thank you for this, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Stand up and say, Grace be with you, all right, to a neighbor. Say, Grace.